All right. So now let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about the Cycling Guide mobile app. First, I want to remind everyone that you are attending an event that is part of Windsor Hackforge. We are a Windsor-based tech nonprofit that serves all of Windsor and Essex County. Our goal is to be a hub, a meeting place for all of Windsor's tech community, whether you are a student, a professional, a hobbyist, whether you like building things with an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, you like writing code or you like building your own computers, we have a place for you at Hackforge. There's no such thing as being too obsessed or too nerdy when it comes to our group of people. We run all sorts of different kinds of events, including this one that you're seeing tonight, where it's a little bit uh, of an introduction into projects that we're working on in the community. We have some that are more tutorial style that are teaching you how to do something, some that are more lecture style. And then we get into with the ones that are just straight up fun, like our video game swaps. Last one of those was in April and keep your eyes out because we will have another one coming up in October. So first, I want to make sure that everyone is aware of the areas that we're talking about. So let's discuss Windsor versus Waterloo. We all know where Windsor is. Not everybody is totally clear on where Waterloo is. And just showing you how small of an area we're actually dealing with in terms of Canada, even if it does feel pretty big. So Waterloo is up towards Toronto, four-ish, three and a half-ish hours away, depending on how fast one drives. So first, I want to talk a little bit too about why we decided that Windsor needs a safer cycling app. Roughly 5.3% of commuters in Windsor use sustainable methods of transportation. So that includes walking, scooters, bikes, rollerblades, anything that is not using a commodity to, to power it. So um, electric scooters, eh, maybe those would count. Cars definitely don't count. 5.3% is the lowest of any Canadian metropolitan area. So what that means is, or census metropolitan area. So what that means is the areas that they break the country down in for census purposes. So those can those are equal, not in terms of size, but in terms of the number of people. And this is a crazy number to me because Windsor is super flat. We have some of the better weather conditions in the country, and yet people here are very much like, nah, -uh, cars only. Obviously, a big part of that is because we build so many cars, but there's still more that should be going into this, right? And in general, it's not just folks in Windsor-Essex who don't like sustainable methods of transportation, who don't like cycling, only 4% of Canadians in general prefer to bike for a trip of only two kilometers, which is crazy. Two kilometers is super, super short. You can ride that on your bike in like two minutes. And 48% of Canadians overall feel like cycling from one place to another in their area is too dangerous. And I feel like that is really the reason for points one and two that we're seeing on this slide. In case you want to double check what I'm claiming here, I do have the sources listed in here as well. So uh, the first point is from StatsCans, that's from our most recent census. And then the bottom two points were from a recent Ipsos poll that was released in May 2022. So you can look those up if you want to make sure that I am being honest with you. All right, so let's talk a little bit then about cycling guide specifically. So this is an application that works cross platform. So you can download it right now if you want to on your you can download it on your mobile device whether it's Android or iPhone it will work on either one of those. And this app is targeted towards average riders. So we're not necessarily looking at the folks who are regularly completing 100 kilometer an hour or 100 kilometer rides we're not necessarily looking for people who it's not targeted towards people who are looking to beat their best time it's just folks who are looking to get around they want to get from a to b and then back to a safely so as we can see in the designs that they've chosen to use in this app it really is representative of a lot of different styles of people and some of the imagery it's even showing older folks it's great big fan of that What's nice about this application as well is it focuses on giving directions that are intended for cyclists specifically. I know things like Google Maps has its cycling routes, but it's not really considering what's best for a cyclist in those cases. While it would keep you from going on something like the 401 or EC Row, 
it will often advise you to ride down Howard or to come see your Dougal, which, you know, living in this area, we know that we don't want to do that. And when people see that, they're like, well, if I'm taking that road and I know that it sucks to drive on, let alone ride my bike, I'm just going to drive because I feel safer. But what people don't realize is that there are alternate ways to get around the city that you might not think about because you're so used to driving in a car that your brain often works the same way Google does, that it's giving more car-centric directions. So Cycling Guide is really aimed on cycling-oriented directions. It also gives you those directions in a way that lets you know how comfortable you're likely to feel on any of the three provided routes, but not just like on the road overall, but on each section, which is really cool. So as I'm riding, I can know which part of the route I want to like mentally prepare myself for and which parts I know are just going to be fun, easy, chill ride. And I love that part of it. Cycling Guide also provides tour routes. So in this case, it's all in Waterloo, but if we want to think about it from a local perspective, if we wanted a tour that took us through a bunch of different wineries out in the county or hit different breweries and micro distilleries in the city. It has tours built in that will take you on that loop, or it might not even be place specific, but just a really nice loop that takes you by a lot of nature, right? These are generally pre-established tourism rides that are listed in the app. And not only does it tell you how to take that ride, but it tells you how to get from where you currently are to the starting point of that route, which is awesome. Cycling Guide also accepts feedback, whether it's feedback in the terms of usability or maybe it the app didn't recommend a route that you know it should or it did recommend a route or it maybe labeled a route in ways that you don't agree with and you want to let us know. That is all possible directly through the mobile app interface. So. I mentioned how it will give you these color-coded routes. So we want to think that about where that comes from. The Cycling Guide group who developed this app, they use the level of traffic stress or LTS methodology for route scoring. So what this does is it gives us uh, scores of one to four. In the app, there's actually a fifth. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the higher the number, basically, the more experienced of a cycle cyclist you're going to want to be, or the, the less comfortable that, ride, that route is likely to be, or that section of the route, at least. So for LTS 1, this is what would show up as that green color. This has a strong separation of all traffic from the cyclist. So this would be something like probably the Ganacho Trail or the Earth Grey Parkway, um, or Great Parkway route, not the like parkway itself, um, where there are no cars anywhere around. This is like strictly cycling or multi-use trails. So the riverfront is another good example of this. This is a spot where it would be suitable for children to ride. Level of traffic stress two, LTS two. Uh, this is where cyclists have their own place to ride and it keeps them from having to interact with traffic except at formal crossings. So there are physical separation if there's higher lane or multi-speed traffic. So we don't have any physical separation in Windsor. So this one is going to be a little bit harder for us to see. But if we're looking at something like a residential road, that's likely to be categorized between uh, LTS 1 and 2, depending on some of the other factors, road width, and perhaps the mm, quality of the road surface, right? So this is a level of traffic stress that most adults can tolerate. LTS 3 is interaction with moderate speed or multi-lane traffic or close proximity to higher speed traffic. So I'm thinking an example of this one in Windsor would probably be something like McDougal. Well, maybe McDougal would come in at a 2. Because McDougal has like some slightly higher speed traffic, but it doesn't generally have multi-lane. But I'm thinking something like Olette would, yeah, maybe we'll put Olette at number three and McDougal at number two. We haven't actually released any of this data in Windsor yet. It's it, the calculation for all this still has to happen. So at this point, I'm just trying to figure it out in my head based on, based on these criteria, right? So this is a level of traffic stress that is acceptable for those classified as enthused and confident. So people who do have more experience riding their bikes, this is going to show up as I think, this is like the, the orange level. 
and then LTS4, I think this is going to be the purple stuff. So this is where most people are not going to want to ride their bikes on this road. So this would be like your Tecumseh's, um, like some of those really narrow parts of Riverside Drive 2, I would also put it a four. Because there's not space for cyclists. There's a lot of traffic. The traffic moves at a high speed. Some things that we can't really plan for, however, are things like drivers not following the speed limit, which is super common in Windsor. Even if the posted speed limit is like, you know, 50, people are probably driving 60 or 70. And unfortunately, we can only base our calculations off of what is the actual available data, which is you know, the legally posted speed limit. So it's never going to be perfect, unfortunately, but what this does give us is a really good starting point. And what it will also point out is how much or how little cycling specific infrastructure we actually have in our region. So things that are labeled as LTS one, where we have those specific multi-use or bike paths, the more we see of those, the more dedicated cycling infrastructure that means we have. And I think we all know that Windsor does not have a ton of that. They've maybe done a little bit of work in bringing in some, you know, the Dougal death trap now has a way around it. Great. Awesome. But we need more than that. This is a starting point, however. So this application can serve a few purposes in that it will give us more comfortable routes for getting around, but it will also show what's lacking. All right. So let's take a look at some route examples. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit on some of these here. So this is a route in Waterloo where it's taking us from EB Games to an audio video store. So we can see here the examples of the three different routes and some of the color coding. So the green is LTS 1, blue LTS 2, orange 3, and then the purple we see over here in the second one is 4. So what it's showing us is this first row, we can see it's kind of squiggly, but there is lots of green going on. So we can expect that to be a super comfortable ride. And we see that it's going to take an hour 48 and it's about 27 kilometers versus this next route here, which is take, which is the same start and end point, but takes a little bit of a different path. And this one has a lot of blue and a fair amount of purple when we get into the end there. So this one's shorter. It takes about a half hour less, 17.8 kilometers. Like it's a significantly shorter ride, but it is much longer. So this gives riders the opportunity to kind of like judge based on their comfort riding, I guess, physically and stress wise, you know, how long you can actually stay on a bike for. Um, And And, you know, how much they want to get to to that place in a specific amount of time. Then also gives us the third one, which is pretty much all level four. And this is a route that we probably wouldn't want to ride our bike on unless we're like super, super in a rush or very confident, maybe a little bit of both. But what we do have is three really great visual cues of what we can expect when we're on our bike. So if I had the app on my phone right now and I'm ready to do this ride, I'm probably going to click, going to go for number one. So I'm going to start my ride. And what's going to happen is this app is then going to route me through step-by-step where I need to go. As of right now, it does not read out the instructions. And if you veer off the prescribed route, it's not going to be able to reroute you back onto the preferred route. This app was only released in May of this year. So it's only been out for a couple of months. So all of these features are things that are coming. Just, you know, it needs to get out there and have some users before some of this goes up, starts going on. I do want to note too, that since it's released in May, the app has already established, I think about 825 downloads, which is pretty good considering right now it is only available in the Waterloo, Guelph Waterloo region. So it's popular up there. We're expecting it could be popular down here as well. All of the the work that we've done over the past couple of years with C3 Tech through Hackforge has really shown that there is an appetite for a safe cycling app. And our goal is for this to really meet that. So on that point, I also do want to know, you know, what happened with what we were building before with WindsorEssexCycling.ca. That website is still up and running and 
we do have some active development work being done on it. So what you'll see right now is the same as what's been up there since probably November, December of 2022, but there will be a new version being released shortly. So what we're hoping is to have these two applications kind of working in tandem where we will have windsoressexcycling.ca, there we go, be used more as a pre-planning tool. So what you're able to do is choose, you know, let me just uh, switch my screen share over and we'll take a look at that for a quick second. Okay. We'll zoom in on that a bit for you. Okay. So when we first open this site, it gives us, you know, a bit of a, an intro to what's going on here. So what happens now is we're able to drop some markers for where we want to go. So let's say I want to start at, not there. I want to start at Jackson Park and I want to go down to the riverfront and then back home to the corner of, let's say, Ottawa and Howard. So I can set up to five of these and what the routing tool does is it decides the safest routes using similar criteria to LTS, but not quite as sophisticated, but all this is still based on open street map data. So what we have now is a route that we can zoom in on and see exactly where to go, but this is not giving us turn by turn directions. What we are able to do is export this to put into our Garmin, for example, if we're into using a bike computer, Garmin or similar. So this is a tool that would be more useful for those folks who are doing some of those longer 100 kilometers, 100 kilometer loops. They want to make sure that they're keeping things, you know, as safe as possible. This tool is really going to help these folks do that. And we are building in turn by turn directions as part of our next release as well. So there will be a little bit more going on with that. But I think that it's something that will work alongside what we've got happening with Cycling Guide without them really kind of clashing too much because they are kind of going after some different audiences. So this application still exists, still under development, not going anywhere, but the Cycling Guide app is just so good. When I first saw this, I was like, impressed and also a little bit mad because like, man, this is everything that I had pictured in my head and like presented beautifully. It's just so good. I'm a really big fan of this application. So I was connected with a cycling guide through Lori Newton of Bike Windsor Essex, Mark Connolly, who is the executive director of the Cycling Guide Foundation, also runs a group out of Waterloo called Zeitspace. And what Sitespace did was when they had some time between projects, they would just kind of have their developers working on this as a, a side project. And they, their timeline actually ran pretty parallel to what we were doing with C3 Tech. However, they were just better provisioned, you know, they, they were working with professionals who were doing this, even if not as their like main job, it was still part of their salaried work. So they had a little bit more time and resources being put into it rather than Hackforge working with community members on a volunteer basis for things like the hackathon, right? Not that any of our folks did a bad job because we all killed it, let's be real. But this is just what happens when you've got folks with a little bit more experience working on something. So they found that this was very well received in Kitchener-Waterloo and they decided that they wanted to see if anybody else might be interested. So they've been reaching out to cycling groups across the province and when Laurie hooked them up with me, I was immediately like, yes, I love this. What do you need to make this happen in Windsor? And so that's, that's where we are now. We have completed a grant application in partnership with Cycling Guide to help fund the release of this in Windsor-Essex. And we're currently setting up meetings with various municipalities and other potential stakeholders to get people to put their support behind this project. It's point we're not really looking for funding from municipalities. We just want them to write us things like letters of support that we can use in other grant applications to show that this isn't just a group of rogue bike nerds releasing an application. This is something that the community wants, needs, and supports. So let's then talk a little bit about 
the data that goes into this and how we can make sure that Windsor is actually ready to take this on if and when the funding goes through so we are able to do this release. I mentioned earlier how all of this was built on OpenStreetMap data. So we have to make sure then that all of our OSM data is as complete and accurate as possible so that the routing is as complete and accurate as possible. So we've started doing some of this with the map roulette challenge that we recently put out. Uh, so let's bring that up, take a look at. So this map roulette challenge was focused specifically on speed limits and speed limit data is going to be really important because the higher the speed limit, the less likely it is to be a very comfortable route for cyclists. So speed limit city of Windsor, there's a ton of roads in Windsor or road segments in Windsor that don't have their speed limits marked, which is really a shame because the vast, vast, vast majority of roads in Windsor are 50 kilometers per hour. We've got like maybe three that are 40, very few that are 100, like, you know, sections of um, EC Road 401, that sort of thing. But, and, and obviously some that are 60, but so many of them are 50 that it gets really tedious actually putting them all in. But we're getting there with it. So far, we've got 2% that were fixed, 2% that are not an issue for an over, overall 4% that is complete. So if you're interested in learning how to use OpenStreetMap, MapRoulette is a really great introduction to this. We do have a whole video on how to use this. Uh, we do have a whole video on how to use this available on our YouTube page. So if you want to go to youtube.com slash at Hackforge, you'll be able to find a list of all of our OSM related events and that walkthrough is available in there. Another way that I have found that we can help to make sure that Windsor's data is as ready as possible is a tool called Osmos, which is a really great, kind of similar to Map Roulette, but a little bit more advanced. So let's go ahead and bring it up. So this tool is called Osmos. And what this does is it is built in with some preset filters that can bring up specific issues in your data. So we want to go over to Windsor. And something that happens pretty often is we will have bike lanes and bike routes that just kind of end. They don't connect to anything else. So it's really hard to route on those because there's nowhere, nowhere to go once you finish with them. Now, I know we could say that's not, it's not just a, a data problem. That's actually a Windsor problem. We have so many bike lanes that just end for no reason. And yes, you are very correct. However, from a data perspective, if we are to uh, want to, if we want to route on these trails, even if they're, you know, maybe not ideal, we can still connect that ending bike lane to the road that it runs on so that the system can use the road to route on. So we want to focus on, we're going to select nothing for right now, and we want to see any not connected highways and cycleways. So if I click that on, we can see everywhere that it brings up one of these little pins is somewhere that the highway cycleway doesn't connect to anything else where it just kind of ends. Some cases it might make sense, but not in all of them. So what we're seeing here is a good example. It looks like and in Willstead Park, this one here just kind of ends and it's not connected to the street or to the sidewalk. So we can open this up in OSM and we'll go into edit it. Yes, we know how to edit. That's okay. And yes, so that's exactly what's happening here where it doesn't actually connect to anything. So if instead we drag this out and connect these two, now it will be able to actually route from one to the other. So before it would not have wanted to send us down this path because once we hit the end of it, there would be nowhere else to go. Now it's connected to the road. Yes, yes, now it's connected to the road. So it will be happy to go. So we can fix that. Um, connecting bike path to road. 
our source for this is um, <laughs> local knowledge. <laughs> And then we can go back into Osmos and mark that when it's done. So this is a great like project management software. It's kind of like Map Roulette, but we don't have to actually write any of the overpass queries ourselves. And it's all just already built in, which is really nice. Now, this is not the only factor we need to consider, but it is a really big one. So we also are working on making sure that all of the OSM data for road surface type number of lanes, all of these things need to be in here so that we can get proper routing. And that, I guess, also includes where our bike lanes are, because not all of those are represented on OSM currently. And then since there are a lot of rural areas outside of the city of Windsor, we also want to consider how to route on those sorts of roads. So if we zoom out here, so if we go out into the county where we tend to not have bike lanes, there's usually only two lanes of traffic, but there can be a lot of it and it can be, you know, 80 kilometers per hour. It's probably not a very safe road, but maybe there's not another way to get around it. And maybe it's 80 kilometers per hour, but there's actually not that much traffic on it. So based on the current LTS rating, it would not want to send us down that road, even if it actually would be totally fine for cycling on. So how, how do we factor this in? That is a question that we're still trying to sort out and we are looking for input from the community. So if you're attending tonight and you're interested in OpenStreetMaps, in GIS data, in cycling, in routing, in any of that, if you want to get involved, please feel free to reach out. You can us up on discord i put the link in the chat earlier or you can send me an email i can put my email address in the chat and find that yeah let's do that so lauren at hackapps.org you can go ahead and reach out to me there and it will be fun to try to answer some of these questions we also have things to worry about like streets with large trucks because there's a quarry or perhaps um large farm vehicles. There is an HGV tag in OSM, and that stands for heavy goods vehicles. So what that does is it tracks whether or not a road is actually allowed to have these kinds of large vehicles on it. So a good example for this one would be maybe like um, Alma heading out into Amsburg. So this one here, there's, I think from Howard over, you actually can't have like semis on that road. So it means you're less likely to run into that kind of traffic, which is great if it's tagged with HGV equals no, but that tag is probably not there because it's not that heavily used, unfortunately. And that also doesn't necessarily mean that there's not going to be tractor traffic on it. Because so I can guarantee you there's going to be tractor traffic on that road. I've experienced it myself. Luckily, I wasn't on my bike, but it's hard enough trying to drive around these vehicles, right? So if you're somebody who's not super comfortable on a bike, you're probably not going to want to try to navigate around like a big combine on your bicycle. So we want to try to factor all of these different things in here. So that, I guess, kind of takes me back to my next slide in here with our data struggles. So rural roading of roads with heavy machinery, roads that have heavy traffic for one to two hours per day, but are otherwise low stress. It would be really great if we could work that in here as well. Um, and there are definitely ways that we can build the, that data in, but it's a matter of collecting it. I think it's going to be more of an issue. We then also want to consider roads that may become less safe during the winter. And not even roads, but also paths. Because some bike infrastructure, so some of those biking-specific paths, are not always maintained in the winter. So we don't want to be encouraging people to go for a ride down something that actually hasn't been plowed or salted and is you know, even more unsafe for now for different reasons. So lots of things still to consider, but the main goal is still to just get the application out and available for Windsor-Essex, get as much data cleaned up beforehand as we can, and then just kind of keep fixing it as we go. So when this is released, we are going to be having people out and testing our routes to let us know if it's giving good answers, if there's changes that we could make. 
So if you're interested in being one of those testers as well, please go ahead and reach out. Once again, the email address, it's there. You can also find more contact information on the HackForge website, which is just www.hackf.org. That is also going to be there in the chat for you. So my email address, some other email addresses are in there as well in case you want to reach out about any of that. Oh, and there it is as well, my, uh, my contact information. So that's everything that I was hoping to go through today. Does anybody have any questions? Um, you can also, again, reach out at any time. I love this project and I'm super happy to talk about it all the time. Uh, I ride my bike to work and back pretty much every day. I live in South Walkerville, ride my bike into downtown. And for the most part, I I feel pretty safe doing it. There's some spots where I'm riding down Windsor Avenue and I'll be crossing uh, Erie and there's not a light there. So maybe sometimes that'll be a little bit not the best but for the most part I have no I don't have any huge qualms with riding my bike in the city so I've got a question here uh, I noticed that in the app they have bike parking on the map where are we for that on Windsor also would we have stuff like bike stations and bike air pumps on the app great question so for bike stations and bike air pumps those are currently not listed on the map but I think there's something that eventually will be put in there which would be great we have to see if Windsor even has any of those left anymore. I know there was a while where there were some of those fix-it stations available down at the riverfront, but all the tools got cut off of them, and I think eventually they just pulled those out. But if we have any of those, we will eventually be listing them in the app, yes. In terms of where Windsor is at, in terms of bike parking, that is a great question. Uh, certain areas are better than others. So downtown has some pretty good coverage because... I have gone around and, and noted a lot of those myself. I've done a fair bit of it uh, on Drew Lard Road as well. So that's definitely some data that could be updated. But what's tough about that one too is I don't think the city even has very extensive data on exactly where there are bike racks in the city. So that will involve a lot more input from the community if we want to really build out that part as well. There are some really great apps to help you do that. I use... Um, every door, it's called every door. Yes, every door and street complete. I find to be really, really good apps for making OSM edits on the go. Street complete is Android only, but every door is cross platform if you want to use it on an iOS device. So if that's something that you are particularly interested in, I do highly recommend using that app uh, or using one of those apps to add in by parking when you encounter it. And if you use the tag to note how many bikes can be parked on a specific rack or in a specific spot, those numbers do show up in the app as well, which is really nice because it is always good to know if you're going to be able to actually lock up your bike somewhere once you get where you plan on going. But that is a great question. Alan, thank you so much for that one. And also based on that question, it sounds like you have actually gone through and downloaded the app, which... I love to see. It's super cool. Right now it does, as I mentioned, only work in the Kitchener-Waterloo region. So you will be you will be kind of confined to that area, but it's enough to give you a sense of how this could work in Windsor. And like, ugh, I am so excited about it. I like I want this released for us yesterday. So I'm pushing pretty hard to make this happen. And if anyone else wants to join the team working on that, you are more than welcome to do so. Again. My contact information is on the screen, it's in the chat, it's in all the places, so feel free to, to do that. So I think that just about does it then. If you do want to join in on this project or you want to keep the conversation going, please follow us on Discord. Uh, it's a great community where everyone's very friendly and happy to talk about different things. So I hope to see you there. We do have an entire channel. Uh, it's called OpenStreetMap Windsor Essex, where we can talk about this project and anything else, map, GIS, OpenStreetMap related. You can also put any comments or questions related to this project just in the open chat and we'll be able to, to talk about it a little bit there as well. So thank you everyone for coming out tonight. I do really appreciate it. Uh, it's a Sunday night. This is the first time I've tried one at this time and it's actually not, uh, not been so bad. So hopefully you all enjoyed it as well. Remember to fill out that community satisfaction survey if you haven't already. That will really help to guide the future of Hackforge programming and let us know 
how we're doing. That one will be closing at the end of the month. What's today? The 23rd. So you've got a week left if you want to be if you want to be providing answers to that one. So thank you all once again for joining us. Really happy to have you here. Thanks for sticking with me through my weird technical issues at the beginning of our event. And stay tuned for more awesome Hackforge and cycling related content. Have yourselves a good night. Enjoy the end of your weekend and we will talk again later. Bye everybody.